for thousands of years, the body is almost a conductor where it says, hey, you're out of tune, you're out of tune, this needs to be, you know, this is too flat, this is too sharp. And those are signs and symptoms. It was great to connect with today's guest and learn more about his early years on the base and meeting this influential teacher we're talking about and then how he got into the career that he's in now and inspiration so much more. Really fun podcast we got here today. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. And Jeffrey Zimmerman is a bassist and a former student of Stuart Nussen. That is the father of Oliver Nussen. Uh, we talk about that a bit in this episode. Stuart was a base teacher that was hugely influential. He was the principal basis that Stokowski always wanted. So we get into that and much more. And and Jeff has s- developed this b- business around a uh, concept he calls harmonetics. It's a, he'll get into it much more. I'm not going to be able to describe it very eloquently here, but he's got a whole website set up, harmonetics.com. We'll link up to that in the show notes so you can check that out. And I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Quick shout out to our sponsor. Sponsors, Upton Bass and Ear Trumpet Labs. More on them later. And here we go with this conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Zimmerman. We can go any direction you like, but um, like, how did you how did you first hear of Stuart? Well, let me backtrack. So, if I go any direction I like, we're going to talk. We're going to end up talking about medicine because okay. double bass is an incredible healing tool. Music is, and I want to bring music as medicine back to the planet. We should, the musicians should be so well, you know, respected and loved for the music that they're producing, which changes the brain, which changes the emotions, which helps the physiology of the whole body. So, you know, we'll we'll get there if that's okay with you. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. I was very lucky. I was, you know, um, I I arrived late, but it's a long story. Um, Homer Mensch took me in as a student at Juilliard Pre-College. I had moved back from England. Stuart Nussen was in England, which is the future. But anyway, I uh, moved back to New York with my family as a kid, and Mr. Mensch allowed me to come into Juilliard Pre-College on a scholarship. That was very nice of him. And so I studied with Homer for a year, but I had a great opportunity to get back and go to the Royal Academy of Music in London. So I studied with John Walton and then Robin McGee, Robin McGee was one of Stuart Nussin's students. Robin was a, a bet. Stuart was going around London. If if I got a, somebody who was musical, I could get him in a symphony orchestra in six months. Robin was a very musical pianist, and Robin said, I'll take you up on that. Six months later, I think he was playing in the BBC um, orchestra. So um, that happened. Robin said, my teacher's coming to, you know, coming to Eng- back to England. He was in Banff at the time. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and my first semester with John Walton said, if you ever want to hear a bass player play, it's Stuart Nussel. He's the best. Nobody, you know, plays like him. So I got to play for Stuart. And I don't know if we, we can swear or not, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, PG this. Okay. I played the Kusevitsky concerto for him to start out with. And after, you know, he said, you can't play an effing note, can you? It was great. I was principal of all these orchestras and, you know, played Badassini and played Kusevitsky. And he knew, Stuart knew I couldn't play a note. And I knew I couldn't play a note. I was I was supposed to play the Kusevitsky, which I did the following year with an orchestra. But he said he knew that I didn't know what I was doing. So it was great. So he said, I'll take you on. So I spent a year with him in Banff, Canada. And after the second semester, his lessons every day, because he played the four-finger technique. Because, you know, for some of the legato passages like Beethoven 9, he really, he felt that you could stay smoother for him, you know, playing four-finger technique. And he was also a very big uh, human being, so he could play like that. Then we then we went to England, and I had lessons every, every other day, like five, six hours a day, where he would sit three inches from, you know, right in front of me and make me go through all the symphonies. I could never play loud enough. I could never play soft enough. But it was old school teaching, you know, and that was, you know, that was that. And then the third year, he, it was, again, old school. I played principal bass and he played my assistant principal. Mm -hmm. But what was amazing about him is he had three simple criteria, which was rhythm, intonation, and then the quality or the character of the sound. So 
where I was very lucky to sit next to him. And again, I've been out of the profession for so many years. I can talk about this stuff um, from a whole different perspective since I've been in medicine since then. Um, he, would he didn't play the bass, he played the orchestra. Okay, so with Barry, his best, Barry Tuckwell was one of his closest friends, probably his best friend, was conducting. As soon as Barry would ask like the second violin section to play something, as soon as they were done, Stewart would play it on the bass. He played the whole passage on the bass. If the clarinet player missed a note, he played it on the bass. You know, and again, you couldn't do this in a normal situation, but he and, he and Barry were so close and it was just, he knew every aspect of what was going on in the orchestra, that quality of sound, and where does a double bass fit in? Um, one lesson we went through, he says, okay, Bruno Walter is conducting. Now, Bruno Walter called him the finest player I've ever heard. Um, so we were doing the, so I did all the Mahler symphonies um, with Stewart, you know, and he would go, okay, Bruno Walter's conducting. And we, you know, playing whichever symphony and he's going, okay, French horn, third horn, it's coming in, it's coming in, coming in, and you've got to place the pizzicato just right. And I would try, and obviously I wouldn't get it right, right? And then you do it like three or four times, and finally, you know, he would sing that part. He knew that horn part. He knew exactly where he wanted that pizzicato placed, and then you get it right. Great. Right. Now we're going to do it exactly the way Stokowski would do it. So he would go through, do that same, you know, piece with, you know, that same horn part, but the way that Stokowski wanted to hear it done. So obviously the way I did it with Bruno Walter, I do the same thing. No, 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 that's all wrong. So again, the uniqueness of him was that, and, and that's why I reached out to you, is that I'm hearing like Joseph Conyers, they're all talking about this great stuff. And you have these incredible bass players. You have these incredible players who are doing this great stuff. And there's a piece that I thought, you know, we could add to that is Stuart's level of what is that quality? What is that character that this piece needs? And, you know, and where do I exactly place it? note? And he lived that 24 seven with the London Symphony where he was principal bass for, you know, 19 years. And he was chairman of the board of the London Symphony for like five years. Wow. What a career. <laughs> yeah, but he took, it was great because he, how, how do I say it? It was so incredibly passionate about making sure it was about the music. He said, when he was chairman of the board of the London Symphony, he said, my job is to make the musicians happy. If the musicians are happy, then the music is, you know, then the music will be played well. Mm -hmm. So he took that very, very seriously. Yeah. 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 Wow. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, uh, we can go so many different directions. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, how did, uh, yeah, just t tell me a little bit more about him. Tell me about your, your encounters with him. Uh, and I love, you know, this is sort of the sort of thing that I've, I thought would be cool to do with the podcast. It's like, I can't interview Stuart, but I can talk to you about Stuart. Right. And I've done the same thing with a couple basis, you know, about Milt Hint and some other big figures. So, um, yeah, wherever, wherever we want to go with this, uh, is fine you, I mean, I can tell you all sorts of, of stories, but one of them, we were driving through, we were driving back from his house. He was driving me to London <clears throat> and he points out a house and he said, Stokowski and I argued over when that house was built because depending on the nails, you know, whether they were flat heads or square heads, depend, you know, depend on the year. He said, I, he said, I did, I, I was right. So <laughs> this is the kind of detail that he would have in the kind of conversations with Stokowski. Another one, I, and I've seen it out there written in a book slightly differently than what Stewart told me, is one day Stokowski comes over and says, what kind of mute do you use? And Stewart goes, well, I don't really use a mute, but, you know, so Stokowski says, what are you talking about? Show me. So Stewart would, Stokowski turns around and Stewart playing the passage and he puts the mute on, take it off, on, off. And Stokowski's like, yeah, you know, I can't tell the difference. <clears throat> Next day at rehearsal, they, you know, they're playing the passage. Stokowski stops the orchestra and goes, principal bass, where's your mute? 
<laughs> and afterwards, he goes, hey, what are you talking? What are you doing? He goes, he says, never tell friends secrets. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's it was just, it, it was an amazing era of time, you know? Um, and the, the relate. I mean, wherever Stokowski would go, they'd be in New York. Stokowski would say, stick by me, and 10 minutes will be out. And they would just go talk to everybody, and then 10 minutes later, they'd, they'd be gone. Everybody thought they spent the evening with Stokowski. Oh, wow. Yeah, so after the year of playing principal, and Stuart was my assistant, basically, he, you know, we sat down and talked. He said, you should go, you know, go into medicine. You know, he said, enough bass players out there kind of thing. And he felt it would be more challenging for me. And Stokowski loved acupuncture and energy medicine. Think about Stokowski. He did, right, he did yoga, ate health food. Um, and he's, towards the end of his life, he was doing acupuncture and said it really helped him. Now, just kind of fast forwarding, think of how important music is now to our brains. Think of how important it was during the pandemic for people to listen to music. I work with um, some special forces people, they all talk about their music. So I really, and, and which is fascinating is part of this, um, the music that really heals the body, there's more research to be done and my fantasy is to start working more in a research hospital, but the low notes, it's the low notes. You know, even when we get below the hearing, a lot of people are doing, but we all know when you hit that low C or B and the whole body is vibrating. Um, we haven't done enough study yet, which we need to do, but the idea is that this harmonizes the body, mm. right? your lungs and your spleen and your kidneys and your liver and your neurological system and your thoughts and how your body moves is all part of this harmonious being of you and everybody else, right? Um, so the idea is to take the knowledge, that's what I'm trying to do, take the knowledge, especially the base family, right? We all help each other, we all work together, um, to, to take that into medicine where it really needs to go. You know, a lot of, a lot of musicians have, you know, been starving off call it from, you know, lack of work. But if we, we realize that music is medicine, we absolutely need this. Um, I flew, I'm in Connecticut and I flew out to Oregon last week. There was a uh, famous pianist who was sent home in, in hospice. Um, Parkinson's disease, neurological collapse, and was in a short period of time smooth, and and the and the person's really healing. And I felt that again. I wish I was in a research hospital, but I felt that the motor neurons in the brain were kind of stuck. Mm. So again, using the energy and the music and all that, they were able to be freed up. And again, if we were in a research hospital, we could have figured that out possibly. But, you know, we saw now this person is fine. They're, you know, uh, they're not out of the woods like playing an instrument. You got to get better and better and better. But they went from this to playing the piano, which they hadn't done in a long time. Wow. So that's the importance of this is why the reason I want to have the conversation with you is you got, you're doing such a wonderful thing with all the bass players and the musicians that you're reaching and stuff like that, how everybody's connecting. But you have this we have this medicine, right? It's incredible medicine. How do you move your joints? How do you breathe? How do you connect in your lungs and your spleens and your liver? Because as I start working with more elderly, their symphony of their body has fallen apart, right? They have Parkinson's disease, they have cancer, they have headaches, they have whatever, you know, and as musicians, we know there's all sorts of injuries from, um, you know, whatever the, their aspect of their music, you know, instrument is. And we need to bring harmony back to the body and back to the world. And music is, you know, such an incredible way to do that. And you've created an incredible platform for that to happen. Upton Bass has an interesting philosophy in terms of selling basses to people. Here's Eric of Upton on the topic. I don't want to sell you one bass. Right. I want to sell you like four. You know, when you're in high school or, or, or college or just starting out or you just, you know, 30 years been playing double bass or electric bass and now you're on your first double bass, you know, you're starting off with a $2,500 laminate. And then I, I want you to, I want you to outgrow it. I want you to, 
to come back and say, now I'm ready for the hybrid. Oh, now I'm ready for the, the solid wood base. Wherever you are on that trajectory, Upton has a base to meet your needs. Learn more at UptonBase.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. They make an incredible mic for upright bass called the Nadine. And six-time Grammy-winning jazz bassist and former Contrabass Conversations guest, Christian McBride is a big fan. Christian says, as an acoustic bassist, it's very important for me to have this instrument amplified as naturally as possible. What I love about this microphone is that it makes the instrument sound exactly how I hear it in my head. Honestly, I don't know if you can get a better review than that. The Nadine is an instrument-mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear natural sound and great feedback rejection. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt with mic purchase from their website. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and learn more about Nadine. Well, it's a, you know, unintentional, but it's been fun to fun to do and fun to be a part of. And the whole music and medicine thing is fascinating to me. I was just in Tuesday. I was in in uh, Wabash, Indiana, and we, in, for a bass festival, and and all the bass players came into the hospital and they were playing for the patients. And they were playing for and and it was remarkable. And my friend and colleague Lloyd Goldstein, you know, down in Tampa, Florida, playing for arts and medicine. My my wife in the other room is a doctor, so certainly music and 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 a former former harpist so there's definitely a, a and you're you're you have a uh, at least somewhat similar path c- coming from music and going into medicine what what is your area of specialty exactly in in medicine i'm a doctor of oriental medicine the, the okay. medicine that Stokowski loved mm-hmm. you know that he he felt changed him so the understanding of energy um of how the spleen and liver and kidney so oriental medicine is just fascinating What's really cool about it, Jason, is that biological mathematics, Western science, um, have paralleled. They've they finally figured out in Western science what Chinese medicine has been talking about for years, for thousands of years. And so I've put the two together. So everything has to be in alignment with Western science, quantum physics, biological mathematics. And when you enter that world, the body can really heal itself. And that's what, you know, my career for music was to leave that to understand, you know, um, this form of medicine. Because look at perfect example of Stokowski, right? He could always produce the Stokowski sound. He could always produce that energy no matter where he went, right? So there's, and, and think of Fantasia and, the, you know, the forward thinking of what he was doing. So my specialty is to understand how, you know, energy medicine aligns with Western science. Hmm. Yes, Stokowski is one of those people that is one of the such a fascinating musician, right? And yeah, you talk about the Stokowski sound. There is that for sure, right? He was able to, and in a, in a different group of musicians. And that I've always found that particularly interesting as a conductor, who you know, the one thing they don't do is actually make sound, right? <laughs> so, so, right. but, but, but how through leadership and through so many, so many of that, the sort of mysteries of of the of that role, uh, how how one could get an orchestra to sound a certain way like that you know is is it has always been fascinating to me right but with the with the opening and the knowledge of quantum physics it's not going to be it's fa- it's always be fascinating on one side but on the other side we have science behind it right mm-hmm. we have and we are going to develop more and more techniques with you know this knowledge of quantum physics and science along with the ancient knowledge of ayurvedic medicine chinese medicine you know, putting that together. And I'm not telling you anything that you, that you don't know. It's, it's the same thing of walking, you know, a great bass player. There's a sound that comes out of the instrument. If somebody's stressed out or whatever, there's a sound that's going to come out of the instrument. It's the same thing with your, your, how your brain works and how your neurological system works. And then how you play the instrument, right? If you're bowing like this, then there's, you're constricting, right? So it's the same thing with how you move the body, how you carry, you know, your base or how anybody carries their own body. All affects the brain, all affects the neurological system. What I start with in the, um, is always tuning the body. We never do that in Western, um, you know, in Western, they were never taught to tune the body. 
It's like the foundation of Chinese medicine. I also studied Kung Fu and Tai Chi and Qigong and all these other aspects of the energy medicine over the years. Hmm. I used to work in the OR when Dr. Oz was a surgeon. He would have me come in and I would work the energy of the patients sometimes to help them heal while he was doing surgery. And yeah, it's, and, but again, it's, it really boils down to music and the bass player and the family and the energy, you know, going again back to Stuart, there was a sound that he had, he felt he had to lay down for the London Symphony, you know, to play on top of, right? That's what the bass section does. First one bass sound, and then the bass section, and the orchestra can be safe. And then things can happen. It's the same thing in our physical body. And what did Stuart do, like specifically, that was different from other bass players? And again, you know, we we talk. I was I was just talking about that magic of the conductor, like what Sikowski did with the sound. Like, did 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 Stuart use? Uh, uh, like, what was his approach to sound? Uh, d- uh, was he thinking more bow? Was he did? Was there anything specific in terms of technique that he was doing? I mean, I'm sure that 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 he, just his approach. You know, he, there are many levels to an approach, but but uh, like. Like, what, what did he do that sort of separated him from some other uh, contemporary players of the time? Uh, to be honest, I truly can't answer that question, but I can give you what my guess was. Sure. I, my guess is what we talked about before. He only thought about the music, and he only thought about, okay, you know, who's conducting, and the relationship of all the players of the orchestra so, so it was it bow control? Sure, it was it bow control? Was it vibrato? Sure, there was vibrato in there. Was it? But, but those are the the surface, you know. So to figure out the underlying, the underlying was we're playing music together, mm-hmm. we're creating a sound together. How do I best serve music, mm-hmm. right? And 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 that more bow, less bow doesn't matter. What mattered was, and so learning all the techniques again that's what i love watching your you know podcasts and all the stuff that you're doing is that these techniques are to serve the music right and you've got great people showing you different things to serve the music but at the end it's serving the music so his mindset was the textures right the how and, and then how the bass supports that so i think you know you come in as you know bruno walter or stakovsky or you know any of the other greats, or George Schulte, right? And Schulte said the same thing about him. He, he comes in, and Stuart already you know has a concept of the textures servicing the conductor, mm. right? So mm-hmm. learning you know faster bow or slower bow, it's all great. But where is your mind? Where is your energy? Where is your thought process? With him, it was the music. Okay. Right. So, so now, and I want to translate that to the brain, the body, the health, right, and wellness of, of you know, the human condition, because we, we need that more and more. Yeah, I I, I agree there. <laughs> yeah. What um, what was what was just thinking about Stuart for for another moment? Um, what was his background like growing up? Do you know much about his? Where his parents musical or what just tell me a little bit about his his path uh, you know seems like a fascinating character well his son ken would give you a better detail of that but stewart's father was a cellist i believe in the halle orchestra mm-hmm. and then um he's i guess he started you know he started obviously he comes from a very musical family um and he studied with several players but what i what i got out of it was I think he developed on his own a lot of it, you know? Um, so he said he studied here and there, but I think it was more, because <clears throat> again, he played four finger. Who was playing four finger technique, right? I think, right. you know, going back to his dad, he probably saw that there, probably the third three, you know, Samandal in the beginning, maybe. And again, his son Ken would be a lot more detailed about that, but it, the music taught him. As far as I'm concerned, all, when I when I worked with him or whatever, he thought differently. You know, he didn't. He wasn't thinking bow technique. He wasn't thinking this. It was like, how do I service the music? You know, yeah. bow technique was secondary, or you know, vibrato was secondary. What is the music trying to say, and how do I get it? So again, the three criteria: what you know, of 
the you know the rhythm, the intonation, the quality of the sound, then what am I practicing? How am I practicing? Right? What am I trying to accomplish? And then he had a, you know a whole routine of how to do that with left hand, right hand. But you've covered when I've seen some of the videos, you you're covering the left hand, the right hand, all the um, things that people are able to do. But the, the piece of it is what was the end result that you're looking for. People have been saying such great things about my course with Discover Double Bass Beginners Classical Bass. Here is Nicholas Walker, professor of double bass at Ithaca College and past president of the International Society of Basses. Nicholas writes, Jason draws from this vast network with his contagious enthusiasm and love of learning. Presented through the beautifully organized and easily accessible framework of Discover Double Bass, this is a terrific learning experience for any beginner as well as a great model for any new teacher. I am blushing, Nicholas. Thank you so much. I'm just so thrilled with how this course came out. Jeff Chalmers and the whole team at Discover Double Bass are so professional. It was such a great experience, and it was the best representation of what I would love to take every single beginner through in terms of format and presentation, and I'm just, I'm just so happy that it's out there. You can learn more. We've got a link in the show notes, or you can just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath. For thousands of years, the body is almost a conductor where it says, hey, you're out of tune. You're out of tune. This needs to be, you know, this is too flat. This is too sharp. And those are signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. That's what the body is telling you. So eventually, if you don't address it, then let's say it turns out to be, I'm using Parkinson's as an example, or headaches, or carpal tunnel, or cancer, or whatever. So the idea is that your body, like the symphony, like the music, is perfect. We have to get there to serve that, that music. So when your body, so... Again, with Oriental medicine, I think uh, Indian medicine, same, and biological mathematics, anything that's wrong with your body is just saying something's out of harmony with something else, and you can bring it back. And so, I, you know, it's going to be really cool to see as we go into the future with our eyes open, hopefully, and our listening ears open, that we're like, okay, how do we help people? How do we, you know, rather than saying, well, music doesn't work or this doesn't work. It's like, okay, let's listen and see if we get the results. Yeah, I think anybody listening can see the parallels to, um, you know, like being in harmony w with your music and then just your body. You're making me, th you're, you're making me just reflect on like when I've had some some knee pain, you know, from running, and then all of a sudden it's like a few other things happen, and it, and it's like my I I do maybe I sleep a little bit better, or I look at my nutrition, or I take a few, you know, and and then I think I'm I'm trying I'm thinking also about my bass playing. You know, something's a little bit off, something's you know physically, or something's a little bit tight or I'm not really expressing and then I look and I connect and I all of a sudden that that flow starts to come back it's uh it's interesting you know I, I a trend I've been seeing that I think is is so great is yeah, I think there's been a fear amongst professional musicians to talk about not being in harmony physically you know being in pain or being and, I, and I'm noticing that in in my world of the symphony orchestra or our shared world or other areas it being less of a forbidden subject and people you know being encouraged to get out ahead of that and to really take care of themselves it's a positive trend in my eyes exactly and that's why what i loved is that um in my experience okay kung fu is for example um just like music uh, every one of these disciplines whether it's tai chi or kung fu or qigong or whatever um you get to the point of you can't make a mis you the tuning is so vitally important and doing things correctly. I played Les Mis on Broadway for like four years. I subbed, you know, pretty consistently for it. And you know, it's three and a half beats of pure silence. And then everybody comes in exactly the same split second, right? And it's amazing that musicians can do this. And this is biological mathematics and synchronization. And, and so all those things that you're talking about, we're all like, ooh, Let's learn more about this. And again, it comes right back to music. Medically, it's that same kind of thing, but musically, it's we do it. Beethoven, not a fit, right? Boom, da, 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 da. How did any how did musicians do that? You know, we're wired that way. And what's cool is, like you said, we're starting to talk about it more. And what I loved about the studies that I had were okay, Kung Fu, if you don't hit me before I hit you, you know, so I'm more efficient in my body movements, right? 
in in energy medicine any you know my knees hurt my body what's going on with that that's why i left the music world to study this form of, of medicine because all these pieces are, are are there for the musicians to start learning oh i can fix my knees i can fix my back so again, I think that's the next stage for all of this. Yeah, no, I hear you. Yeah, it, it is pretty pretty freaky if you if I think I think about this sometimes. Like it's like a pizzicato is coming up, and there's some rubato, and and you know if you're in in a section that's really in tune with each other in an orchestra, it's like how do we all know? Boom, that's where it is. And if I think about it too much, I almost like can't do it, you know. But it's it's <laughs> that 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 magic or like what you're describing, like Beethoven five. Like how does how does uh, how do eighty some people or how whatever the number. Is, synchronize and just feel uh, it's it, it's it's pretty it's pretty wild if you start to think about it but what's really cool about this jason is that western science got smaller and smaller they you know they they start to get smaller and smaller as they get more sophisticated and then they go everything is trying to synchronize it's scientifically sound now you've seen the metronomes they start a whole ton of metronomes and then after a few minutes, they're all working together. Women that work together, they all go, yep, that happens. Oftentimes the menstrual cycles all synchronize. This is how we are, we are wired deep down inside. So again, any medical condition, you know, my back hurts, my knee hurts, you know, it's, you know, something is out of sync. And then just like you said, how can, they, how can the whole bass section play those pizzicatos exactly in the same split second over a period of time or an orchestra mm -hmm. and we just we take it for granted because yeah we should because it's built in but as soon as you start thinking game's over <laughs> Yeah, you do take it for granted when you do it a lot. But I, I'm re I, I, about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, I was watching this uh, high school, like a top honors orchestra play. All these different students, you know, 15 to 18 or something like that. And I was just watching. I don't remember they were playing Chike 5, Last Move or something. I was just thinking, I was just like looking at all these people just like like in, in sync with each other somehow, you know, through this sheer. And I just thought like how how cool that is and how rare that is in, in most people's lives to be able to be in in harmony in synchronicity like that in that you know it's it's it really is a remarkable thing we do and yes we might take it for granted but if you just can step away and think about it and i think a lot of people have had that opportunity in COVID. you know i had my first time to play with other humans uh last wednesday and it was so great and so like refreshing to like get off the plane and all of a sudden i'm playing bass quartets and we're we're taking time and we're knowing we're at we're we're adjusting our vibrato together and uh, I've had a good opportunity to not do that, and so I'm not, I'm I'm really marveling at at just how we all can work together, like you're describing. Yeah, but to your point, Jason, this is why music is so vitally important, right from I'll call elementary school. Think about what you just said. You just you guys are playing together. There's a connection. You're thinking about we're gonna we're to the level now with Justin our vibrato to be together. How wonderful is that for the brain? How wonderful is that for the camaraderie of the kids? How wonderful of that is that hand-eye coordination? And the other side of it is, if you make a mistake or I make a mistake, we laugh at each other, we, we support each other, you know, and, uh, and you move on. You, you know, so the next guy or, you know, girl, whoever in line, we'll just laugh at each other and have more fun. Yep. You know, and, and, and that's the key. That's why, again, I'm looking at how important music as medicine music as you know all those dimensions of human interaction and brain coordination and hand-eye coordination with you so is vitally important to human development and we need to you know make the world aware that's what i love about what you're doing you're making the world aware of how vitally important these things are so you know we got to keep now we have to people go yeah that does make sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right yeah. So it always comes back to the bass section again, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it does for us. Uh, certainly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
But yeah. no, it's 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 right. What do, if someone wanted to kind of get more? Th- this is probably an impossible question to answer. But if someone did want to start to think about um, th- being more in tune with serving the music like that, or being more in tune with their body, or how music relates to medicine, or can can you know can be healing? Are there any books or resources you'd point people to? I bet there are probably too many to to mention. But are, is there anything you can think of that that? Well, that's. That's exactly what I'm putting together right now. Okay, cool. So they can, you know, e- you've got my email. You want to put something mm-hmm. together, and I'll, it's harmonetics.com, and I can put something together with you. And I'm just launching. I'm a one man band. I mean, you know, to build the websites and do all, all the pieces of that. Um, so there are multiple resources. I would like to f- get our team together, find some people that, you know, probably are listening to you already and say, hey, let's do this together. Find out who's already out there. What I've seen, some of the stuff that I've seen, um, people are only thinking of themselves. And a lot of, for me personally, the, some of the music stuff, I'm not sure about, but dealing with musicians like you and the people that we know, again, back to servicing the music. Is it about me and how much money I'm going to make? Or is it about what's right, what's good, you know? Um, so I'm trying to do my bit. I'd like to work with people who are, you know, part of our, I'll call it musical family that have the same intentions, right? The intention about playing the orchestra, being supportive of that, as opposed to, you know, as we all know, there are people out there that aren't thinking that way. Yeah, cool. Well, I would be sure to send people to, to uh, your direction. And I, I, I know that there are a lot of people that are thinking the way we're describing. And you just reminded me of a story I've shared on the podcast, but I have to share again. I'll be brief. But I, I sure. when I first moved to San Francisco, I was playing the Golden Gate Base Camp. We were playing the faculty recital. And who was playing on that recital? Let's see. Rufus Reed, uh, Diana Gannett, a fabulous soloist. Um, other, other people kind of known like that. And it was the sort of thing that Jason from like 19, 19- 96 would have been totally freaked out and I and I was playing too I got to add and 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 it was Diana Gannett this wonderful bass teacher soloist played and then I was next and and Jason from college or Jason from early professional I would have just been thinking oh they're all good well how am I going to compare but you know what I, I don't know whether it was doing this podcast or just getting older or whatever but I had this a vibe of like that we're just participating in this beautiful thing together and Diana is sharing the music and then I'm going to share the music and then Rufus is going to share the music and maybe it was moving out to California got me a little more mellow I don't know what it was but but I I I was rather than being freaked out or nerves or clamped up I was just like going with the flow and I've felt more like that than not you know do I get, have things where I'm you know not in harmony or nervous or things get feel you know messed up sure but I think I've definitely had much more of that attitude and so I you're 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 striking something within me for sure Right. And again, that's what we need to do with our joints and our breathing and, and all aspects of our body. And what you just said, and it's a lot more fun. It felt great rather than, you know, um, competing. Right. It's it's and that's again. And I just when I went out to Eugene, I saw the same thing in the piano family where everybody was supporting each other. I was only exposed to the bass family. That's why I keep saying this. But I saw the same thing in other instruments, I think. I think we're all doing the same thing because what it makes the music better. So mm-hmm. in, in, in my work and what I'm bringing to the planet is yes. How can I help you make your body more harmonious, whether it's physical movement, energy, what, whatever needs to happen. And we do need a family and a team to um, like an orchestra, right. To bring this to the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's something I think. Uh, ba- you know, being bass players, I, I, there, I think that um, our, our instrument, our community, tends to be fairly open, and 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 uh, and I think sometimes I've been guilty of this. We sort of look at other instrumentalists and think like, "Oh, you all are just fighting with each other," and that's not the case necessarily. You know, this the, what I was at in Indiana. They had a piano program just a couple of weeks before, and it was a, 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 a very collaborative and open and sharing program too. So it's it's. Uh, but I think still I. Th- I think bass, I just the the nature of the supportive nature of what we do as bass players, the foundational nature. I think it tends to make us um, 
again, I might be wrong, but I think it tends to make us uh, particularly open and 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 willing to to connect with each other and learn and and develop. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. So for that, so for me, it was just leaving that world because you know Stewart lived on a different planet. The way that he could take all that information. And so when he, you know, he said to me, you'll play principal of go to Houston for five years in Chicago or whatever. He said, it's not your life, your mm -hmm. life, go to be a doctor, go into medicine. So for me, it was to then to follow the medicine that Stokowski loved, which is coming to my mind back around what you were talking about. Just think if we could take Fantasia and bring it into a, you know, back into the medicine that I think is where it started, mm -hmm. where he just did they didn't have the tools there. They didn't have maybe they didn't have the camaraderie. They didn't they certainly didn't have the quantum physics that we know now, how you know how vitally important this is. So I don't know how much time we have left, but that's essentially all that I want to, you know, to share is that we have and all of us have these, you know, wonderful traditions that we all came from to, you know, help each other. I forgot to mention this in the intro, but I'm kind of powering through these intros, outros, so I think I'll just leave it here. And and if you've made it this far, if I sound like I'm yelling in this episode, what happened, which I this is like classic Jason, is right before I talked to Jeff, I knocked over my stinking Zoom H6 for the second time. I think I've talked about this on the podcast. I had this Zoom H6 that has been my war horse since 2015. I have taken it all over the world. It's been great. And then maybe six months ago, I was I, I'm in my carpeted condo uh, and I knock it over on its side, but it's standing like a foot off the ground on a selfie stick. It's not exact. It's not like it's from a great distance. It landed on the headphone jack and the headphones were plugged in and it knocked out my audio. Oh, uh, just just broke the, the connection in there. I thought, OK, well, maybe that's a sign. And I've been having some memory card issues with that Zoom, too. It was like getting a little inconsistent, but it, I, I did hundreds of hundreds of hours of recording on it so okay fine so i order a new h6 i think my that's something that every five six years okay let's replace that that that's understandable and then within a like a month of having it i knock it over on the stinking usb which i also have it plugged into and it shorts out the usb okay so that happened right before i talked to jeff <laughs> And I'm like, great. So I'm running around looking for my old H6 just so I can have an audio interface or a USB mic or whatever. Pull up my old H6. But of course, the audio, um, maybe it's good I'm explaining this at the end. So I didn't have this like overly long, whiny intro or, or overly explaining intro. So so I I can't, the, for the last couple months, and I am getting, Zoom said that they would uh, uh, repair or replace that one because it broke so so quickly. Um, but I have not been able to hear myself in my levels so which is which is annoying I, I'm just used to being able to hear me in in the mix as well so I know if I'm loud or not loud and I think I was in such a rush that I was just talking to I, I had the volume up too loud in the zoom so anyway that's why I was like that and that's what happens when you're doing an indie podcast and and weird stuff breaks try to try to be good about that but sometimes it breaks this is outro three of four although I guess the last episode was just a short one so I just kind of uh, did that all in one take but uh things are good here it is august 25th as i record this so these are going out in september right if i do my math right i think so um yeah and and yeah september uh, i'm i've got a few cool things coming up assuming that some new crisis doesn't wipe everything off the calendar but i should be in south texas uh, more on that when that becomes finalized but i should be in south texas and then i will be in nashville tennessee doing a little more recording with discover double bass jeff chalmers of discover double bass is at the moment in a room uh, oh, and he has to be in Aruba or someplace 
not in the UK for two weeks to be able to enter the United States and do some recording. What a what a crazy thing to have to do just to be able to get to Nashville. But that's what he's doing. And uh, I'll be recording with him. And then I head from Nashville to Houston, Texas for a teacher in service. And I am going to be doing it with a few people, including Joey Nager, who's a wonderful bass, luthier bass maker in Houston. Had him on the podcast. Oh, boy. We've done so many episodes. It's probably like four. 400 episodes ago or 500 episodes ago. Although, you know, he's been on, he's been on incidentally a few times. He was on that Luthier round table. He was on the, an ISB, uh, build a base, you know, 20, 30 episodes ago. So actually Joey's been on a lot, but, but yeah, wonderful person. That'll be a lot of fun. And then I think I hunker down for a little bit in San Francisco, uh, uh, uh the vacation trip to Chicago in November, kind of a weird month to go on vacation. Then a work trip to Chicago in December, not a great month to go to Chicago typically, but we'll see. And then, yeah, Christmas in Portland with the family and 2010, 22 coming up. So we'll see how things go. 2021 has, has been uh, a little more active than I was expecting. If you asked Jason in August, 2020, what, what he'd be doing uh, a year from now, I would have expected to still be sitting at home um, and, and not leaving the place or not leaving the neighborhood. So it's been nice <laughs> to leave the place. And, uh, but it's also nice to be back at home. And as I do this, my dog who just took to the vet um, did nothing nothing major but took him to the vet today so he is sleeping recovering from the vet underneath me I'm going to wrap up here and do some practicing for this event in South Texas and I just want to quickly thank the team while we put these podcasts together Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Mitch Mooring and Trevor Jones. Mitch, another great luthier in Texas, uh, makes award winning bases in Kilgar, Texas that's east of Dallas, Fort Worth learn more about everything Mitch does at MitchMooring.com. I'm your host Jason Heath and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.